Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a, another edition of uh, Think Like a Scientist here with the Birch Aquarium. Uh, my name is Alan, and below we have... And Chica, hi. <laughs> this is Aunt Chica, a.k.a. and Sharka. We call her Ancharka because she knows so much about sharks. Every and, time, uh, Alan. <laughs> every time. I always like to point it out. I got to give my, uh, my co-host props, you know, because she's super smart when it comes to sharks. And uh, that's kind of cool that we're talking about teams already because today our uh, our discussion topic is going to be something super cool called symbiosis. And uh, symbiosis is really awesome because it's all about teamwork in the ocean. Uh, we like we really like symbiosis because it's something we can think about, uh, you know, as humans and working together. Teamwork makes the dream work. And so first off, we're gonna uh, talk about. Uh, what is symbiosis? And so symbiosis, uh, the definition, is the interaction between two different organisms associated together in the same environment. So that sounds kind of similar. It's like, uh, like you know, your co-workers uh, here at the office. Anshika, who's, who are some people you work with at the office here? I work with Alan. I work with a lot of other awesome aquarium employees, like a lot uh, other interpreters, because that's what we do. Um, I work with some instructors, a lot of great people. Some of my favorite coworkers are the ones inside the exhibits, which we'll definitely get to talk about today. But I love getting to call different fish and sharks my coworkers too. Yeah, we work together. Like we educate people about the sharks and the sharks and all the animals are there. Cool to look at. So symbiosis uh, is when really, I guess, two animals work together, sort of like how we're working with someone who's on the back end of the stream right now, actually. Our friend Caitlin, you can't see her, but she's super awesome. And she's kind of running the, the live stream and the slideshow for us. And we're giving the presentation. So that's, that's really similar because uh, that's like a, a positive symbiosis relationship. So we're working together to get this live stream going. And a lot of animals in the ocean work together with their companions in the same environment to kind of get a similar job done. And but symbiosis. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, okay. you go. Uh, symbiosis is really cool because it's everywhere. Like after today, hopefully you guys might notice it's kind of in every aspect of life. Like while we were coming up with this topic, we kept like we had to keep narrowing things down because there's examples of symbiosis within symbiosis, which we'll talk about later. But it's just really cool. Like you can find symbiosis pretty much everywhere in the world, like with yeah. humans, with animals, everything. It's really, it's really awesome. It's such an important concept. Yeah, and with so many different types of symbiosis, uh, it's it's very important to know that within symbiosis, the different types are really defined by how uh, the parties are affected. So some they can be affected positively, so each side may benefit. They could be affected negatively. Maybe someone benefits while the other doesn't benefit, or they could be affected neutrally. So maybe one benefits and the other, uh, nothing really happens to it. It doesn't really affect it. And so something we do want to think about uh, when it comes to symbiosis is why is symbiosis uh, so important? So that's a really good question to think about during our live stream today, because we're going to come back to this at the very end. So keep thinking about it um, as we're talking about the different types of symbiosis. Maybe see if there's anything that you might, that you viewers might think why symbiosis is important. Why, why have so many animals developed symbiosis with each other and just kind of exploring it throughout their, throughout their lives. Yeah, because they're definitely, symbiosis isn't anything new. It's been around for a really long time. So we'll definitely get to that. And so something we're going to talk about right now is all the various types of symbiosis that we're going to explore. So Anshika, what's, uh, why don't we get started with probably our favorite type of symbiosis? Yeah, so I think, uh, so the first type of symbiosis is actually called mutualism. And this is probably the symbiosis that you might think of. It's where both organisms benefit. So it's a win-win situation. It's everyone's happy in the situation, best case scenario. This is what we want to see you know this yeah, is where it uh, seems like a good time for everyone in this case exactly and a great example of mutualism is clownfish and anemones so what's really if you guys have ever visited our aquarium or been somewhere else where you can touch an anemone you might have noticed it might be a little bit sticky and that's because anemones have special um stinging cells on their body that will 
help them catch food. So they're little nematocysts that will sting other animals, um, sting fish, and that's how they, they will catch their food. But the mm -hmm. clownfish was like, no, 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 I am going to use this to my advantage. So what they did is they developed a mucus that they secrete over their entire body, which prevents them from being stung. So they can go in to the anemone and be fine. That's pretty cool. So, that has a great example of this. Um, sorry, yeah, Alan, what were you going to say? So when you come to the aquarium, you know, like if you uh, have ever touched like the uh, anemones that are tide pools, uh, like Anshiga said, it has that sticking sensation. But the reason why we, uh, you know, don't feel like the the harm or the pain for it is because our skin is uh, too thick to feel it. So the way the uh, clownfish, you're saying, they kind of secrete that mucous membrane is just giving it an extra layer of protection similar to how we have extra protection. Exactly. And so this benefit is definitely benefits the um, the clownfish because it creates that layer of protection so that they can hide in this anemone and live inside of it. And it's basically their own little fortress where other fish that might eat the anemone or my sorry, that might eat the clownfish can't get into. So it's a little protection layer for the clownfish and the anemones benefit too um, uh, because the anemones need to eat as well. So sometimes fish that are coming to eat the clownfish will get stuck in the anemone and that'll um, feed our anemone. And it's also really useful because the clownfish likes a nice tidy home. So mm -hmm. the clownfish actually can like graze on things and keep our anemone looking nice and clean. And a great thing that you might not think about with um, clownfish and anemones is that fish pee is actually full of nutrients. Really? I know it's kind of gross, um, but it, been, it actually helps a lot of things grow. And so the clownfish, just by living its normal life, helps helps the anemone grow um, and get a lot of extra nutrients that it wouldn't normally get. Yeah, I like how you I like how you mentioned uh, it kind of just lives its normal life. You know, these guys, it's 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 cool to see that you know it's not like a, an exchange. Like, hey, uh, you do this one time, I'm going to do this for you. It's like they're just doing what they usually do, and they've just naturally come together to uh, work together, which. I think it's just just awesome that they they've naturally done that together. It's something we could probably think and and, and learn from. And also, when it comes to mutualism, this brings up a another species that I really like called the Hawaiian bobtail squid. And so he's really cool because this type of mutualism is on like a much smaller scale. So the Hawaiian bobtail squid, its uh, symbiosis is actually with the bacteria inside itself. And so unfortunately, we don't have a, a picture up right now. Uh, but what the Hawaiian bobtail squid is, it uses a bioluminescent light cavity inside of it to uh, hunt prey at night. And the way it's able to make bioluminescence uh, in its light cavity is due to a bacteria called Vibrio fishery inside of it. And so that's like a really cool symbiosis because if you just looked at the Hawaiian bobtail squid itself, uh, you wouldn't think there's a symbiosis going on there. But when you look down at sort of a more micro level, you see that, you know, bacteria is a living thing. There's lots of it everywhere. It's in our guts. It's all over the place. And those little organisms are then having a, a symbiotic relationship with the much larger animal. So that's a that's a really cool way to think about it. It can get to really big scales and really small scales as well. And it's perfect with Christmas right around the corner, uh, thinking about how animals can light up. And how that's also symbiosis is definitely really cool because it's kind of a reminder of just with Christmas and New Year's around the corner, it's their own celebrations. Yeah. <laughs> they do it year round. Yeah, the wine, yeah, the Hawaiian bobtail squid likes to celebrate year round. And that's one of my favorite examples of symbiosis. I learned about him uh, or him or those guys from a, uh, a symbiosis class I took in college. And I've just been obsessed with them ever since. So definitely go look up some videos or pictures of those guys because they're really cool to check out. So another kind of uh, symbiosis, Anshika, what's a, what's like another one that comes to mind to you? This one right here is commensalism and it's actually really, really cool. And this animal right here is an animal that we've talked about before and I absolutely love. Alan, can you tell us a little more about commensalism? Yeah, so with mutualism, we had uh, like a plus and a plus for both the species. That's uh, where they both benefit. For commensalism, this is gonna be more of like a plus and a uh, like a neutral, more of a zero. We like to when we like to describe different types of symbiosis, we kind of put them in parentheses with uh, like either a plus, minus, or a zero to show the relationship of the two animals. 
And so with commensalism, uh, this is a relationship, again, with two different organisms where one benefits while the other uh, doesn't necessarily get affected. So this is, a, you know, another kind of good example because, um, for example, in this picture, the barnacle benefits, uh, they get more access to food as they're attached and they move around with the whales. But the gray whales, they don't necessarily um, have anything happen to them. They don't gain any sort of uh, benefit from the barnacles being on there, but it doesn't necessarily uh, harm them. And so that's a, that's definitely an example of commensalism because the barnacles benefit, whereas the whale, they're just kind of, they're okay with it. They don't really mind. And Jiga, uh, where can you like find gray whales around here? I think you can definitely find some some around here. Yeah, they're actually migrating down our coast they kind of started a few months ago and they should be, you should actually be able to start seeing them very soon if you just look out into our ocean because they're migrating down from up north all the way down to Mexico. And because these whales are so big, like you were saying, Alan, the barnacles are like the barnacles are super small. Like you don't really notice them. That's the thing. I mean, we probably would because we're not as big as a whale, yeah. but with how big the whale is, they have barnacles on them because they move kind of slowly. And mm -hmm. it just, it doesn't bother them at all, which is kind of funny. Like imagine having all of these little things just attached to you your whole mm -hmm. life. You just were like, okay, that's part of my body. That's <laughs> how it happened. Yeah, they're okay with it. And uh, yeah, it, they're, they got much bigger plans in mind because uh, when the gray whales are coming up and down our coast, they're migrating from feeding grounds up in uh, Alaska. And they're coming down to these uh, breeding grounds down in uh, Baja, California, these nice shallow lagoons. So, you know, they got a big mission in mind. So they're probably not too worried about these little guys hitching a ride as well. And um, they also stick very close to the coast, gray whales. They don't go too far out into the open ocean. So I'd probably, I, I'd hypothesize that maybe when they're swimming close to maybe these more rocky areas around the coast or maybe kelp forest, I'd assume some of those barnacles may be hopping on sometime around there. So do you, Anshika, do you happen to know, I, I'm not sure if it's something scientists are still researching or not, but are you familiar at all with um, how barnacles attach to whales or when? You know, that's a good question. I think just with, because they move at a whopping, like most of the time they're moving like five, 10 miles an hour. They're pretty slow moving animals. Um, they really can attack, the barnacles are just, when they're younger, they're just kind of floating along in the ocean until they find something to attach to. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything, if there's definitely probably studies still being done about it because whales are pretty elusive creatures and you only really see them when they come up to breathe, which isn't their whole, like they, they don't breathe all the time. So yeah. um, uh, it's definitely something that's still, that's I would be surprised if people had stopped studying it because who doesn't want to study whales? Yeah, um, that's so awesome. Yeah, so definitely something that I think is, the case where it's still being studied, but they kind of just attach as the whales are moving. Mm -hmm. And because the whales don't move very fast, the barnacles stay on their body. Nice, that's that's pretty smart of the barnacles to, uh, you know, kind of take advantage of that, that symbiotic uh, relationship there. You know, get a free vacation, free ride, get some free food while you're at it. All, all inclusive trip for the barnacles. <laughs> yep, and they'd have to do no work for it. They just sit there. Yeah. That's and so yeah, that's a that's a pretty awesome time. Sounds like to me, I'd I'd love to do that. But moving on, we got some more types of symbiosis to talk to. So, uh, Anshika, what's a what's another one you're thinking of? So one that I think a lot of people might be familiar fam familiar with is parasitism. So that is um, where one organism will benefit the parasite, and the mm -hmm. other will be harmed. Yeah, that doesn't sound very fun. It's not really. I mean, the thing is, like, it's something that I definitely think a lot of people have heard of because you hear about parasites all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the biggest thing about parasitism is that the parasite, their goal is to keep the host alive so they can keep feeding on it mm -hmm. over time. They, they don't want to just like completely take out the host in one go because then their food source is gone. Yeah, and it's not good. Like the the parasite relies a lot more on the host in this case exactly so it may sick like the parasite may sicken the host and cause it to die over time or yeah. but it won't it was not going to be like a one and done interaction it's a very prolonged process mm -hmm. and so what's really interesting i recently learned this about a kind of a christmas themed parasite alan do you have any idea what i might be talking about hmm well, when it comes to parasites and Christmas, 
I'd have to say I don't think it's the reindeers or or anything like that or or the 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 elves up at the North Pole, but is it maybe a plant or something? It is. So I this kind of blew my mind when I realized when I learned it. Mistletoe is actually a parasite. You no might way. realize it. But essentially what happens is it'll send its roots into the barks of other trees. Yeah, Marianne, Marianne got it. Um, uh, nice job. Yeah, mistletoe. Um, uh, so it siphons the water and other nutrients out of the bark mm -hmm. of uh, different trees. So that's crazy, right? Like I really had no idea that. Yeah, wow. That it, it, really, it really comes up there. And, and, and like, so, so since this is like a type of parasitism, I would assume that as soon as the, uh, the mistletoe is done siphoning the water and nutrients out of the tree, I'm assuming the tree dies and then eventually so would the mistletoe because it loses its uh, source to uh, food, water, and nutrients, right? Um, yeah, definitely. I think it would take a long time for it to actually happen because mm -hmm. trees are pretty big and mistletoes are yeah. pretty small. Yeah. Um, so definitely, I think over a long period of time, if the mm -hmm. mistletoe grows big enough and kind of encompasses the whole tree, it could definitely cause that. Um, mm -hmm. But let's also talk about this animal here, which is one of my personal favorite animals, the mola mola, ocean mm -hmm. sunfish. I absolutely love them. And what's really crazy is that these guys can host up to 40 different kinds of parasites because mola molas are huge. Wow. They won't notice tiny little parasites. It's kind of like the whole whale thing, except it it um, hurts the sunfish. Um, oh, but like, yeah. They can weigh up to like they can weigh a couple tons. Like they can they can get super big. Um, so you get things like tapeworm larvae or little copepods that hang out on them that just because these guys also move really slowly with that weird shaped body. They can't mm -hmm. really move very fast. Um, so parasites are able to live on them. And so these guys will actually come up to the surface and just kind of sun themselves. And what happens is that when molamolas come up to the surface to thermoregulate, seagulls will actually land on them and treat it like a feast. They'll peck off the parasites. And that actually is another kind of symb symbiosis. Oh anyway, my remember, can you're I telling me that this sunfish, like I thought at first when you said he has 40 different types of parasitism potentially going on, I thought, wow, that's already 40 separate symbiosis uh, interactions in one. And then now you're telling me there's also a mutualistic and a completely different type of symbiosis also happening with this guy? Yep, because oh the, the, I know it's crazy. It's everywhere. Animals work together all the time. So this guy will just come up to the surface. The seagulls will peck off all those parasites. Seagulls' bellies are full and the mola mola has a few less parasites on it. So it's definitely very helpful for these guys. Like there's just symbiosis is literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. And like we were saying earlier, there's symbiosis inside of other symbioses, which is honestly really crazy. Yeah, that is that is so cool. I uh, I was totally not like when you when you, it's cool to think that, you know, there's just all these different processes. And when you just really look closer or just at a completely different angle, uh, you can see uh, like, you know, just totally opposites, mutualism versus parasitism all happening on the same animal. So that's pretty cool. And also, I'm glad you brought up sunfish. Is there one of my favorites, too? I always forget just how big a sunfish is until you see one come to the surface and you know, it gets uh, like videotaped uh, or you see it close to like a boat or something. You realize, wow, these sunfish are so big. Those guys are awesome. Mm -hmm. They're definitely one of my favorite fish. Mm -hmm. And let's see. So we've talked about a lot of really interesting types of parasitism. I'm sorry, of uh, symbiosis, also yeah. parasitism. Um, <laughs> is there one that maybe people won't think of as symbiosis? Maybe something that's a little more quick and permanent? Yeah, so with that being said, the last type of symbiosis is predation. And so predation actually kind of just sounds exactly uh, like when you see leopard, shark, and prey. Uh, the only kind of interaction between an animal, a predator, and its prey is where the predator eats the prey. And so I know when you think of symbiosis, uh, you think of, oh, like, oh, yeah, you usually, most people think of the mutualistic kind. That's the best one you think of. Cause you know, everyone's winning. You get like the little birds on rhinos who pick off bugs and stuff. But when we get down to the definition of symbiosis, you know, like we said earlier, it's the interaction between two different organisms in the same environment. And because in predation, 
uh, when one animal, like the predator, eats the prey, the predator positively benefits while the prey negatively benefits. So um, obviously, uh, as negative as we can get. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's benefit on one end, there's benefit on the not uh, other end. But then again, that's the circle of life. And that's how these ecosystems interact with each other. So even when it comes down to it, symbiosis can be something as simple that happens every day with basically every animal. So if you think about it, um, every animal experiences symbiosis in some way or another, whether it's, you know, something really fascinating like mutualism or parasitism, um, or even something as simple as just predation. That's a uh, symbiosis is all over the place and it's always happening. Definitely. And so after talking about all this symbiosis, um, we wanted to kind of bring it back to our favorite place where I'm actually at right now, the Birch Aquarium here at Scripps. So there's so many awesome types of symbiosis that we uh, have here, um, not only off our coast, but at Scripps here. And so we just wanted to talk to you guys about a few specific ones here, give you a little uh, sneak peek and view into the aquarium right now uh, as we are. We are unfortunately closed for the for the meantime, but here we're going to get you a little sneak peek inside the aquarium. So Anshika, um, let's get started. Uh, what's, what's the first one you want to talk about here? Okay, so I am definitely a big fan of the kelp forest. Uh, it's, I've scuba dive, I love spending time in the kelp forest. This is actually a type of symbiosis we haven't talked about yet. Um, but basically this one is competition, which is mm -hmm. pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's where different animals will compete over limited resources. So competition can happen between members of the same species or between different species. So this right here, our kelp exhibit is a great example of that because if you ever came on site to watch any of our kelp forest feedings, you'll see all the fish are clambering to get fed at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can also watch these on our live streams as well. We have a 24 seven kelp cam right now. You can definitely go check it out. Hopefully you might actually end up watching a feeding because they're not really scheduled at this time. So um, just kind of what you might get lucky and um, actually get to watch one of our feedings. But essentially the, the goal of the divers is to make sure all the fish get enough food Mm -hmm. so that they all will survive. So mm -hmm. competition is not really as prevalent here in our exhibit, but take this exact same habitat, this exact same ecosystem and take it out into the ocean. There's a lot of competition out there. So animals of the same species, all the Garibaldi or all of the leopard sharks end up kind of fighting for the same food, but it also is between species too. So a lot of kelp forest fish will eat very similar things like small crabs or snails, things like that. And so they're all, the interaction between them is kind of a positive negative too, because one of them gets the food. The other one kind mm -hmm. of doesn't. Yeah, that's kind of, I, I like that you mentioned that our, you know, when our aquarists feed the animals, um, you know, obviously they make sure that every animal gets fed, every animal's healthy. So that does decrease that um, sort of amount of competition here, uh, you know, at the aquarium. But that's very, it, it's kind of interesting because I remember talking with the Aquarius when they, they do their leopard shark feedings at Shark Shores, they actually, you know, monitor uh, different markings. Like I know there's one uh, leopard shark with a couple, kind of like a sort of like X sort of marking on, uh, on their head. And so it's just kind of interesting to kind of consider how with competition, the uh, Aquarius are keeping that in mind as they're feeding the, the animals. You know, they're, they're not just tossing the food, you know, into the tank going, oh, like, here you go. Like, uh, here's all the, the mackerel and squid for the sharks there. They're, you know, lowering them down, making sure that each one uh, eats uh, an equal amount because they, you know, they're aware that there's that competition, not only uh, between different species, like you said, in the kelp forest, but then at shark shores, you know, there's competition between just the leopard sharks. So it's happening on a couple different levels, that competition. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then another really cool type of uh, symbiosis we have here uh, is something called the cleaner shrimp. Now cleaner shrimp are super awesome. If you've ever seen them before. Uh, what they actually do is they clean uh, parasites from fish, eels. This is an example of a, uh, a mutualistic relationship. So we got the cleaner shrimp as he's cleaning parasites and stuff um, off of animals. If uh, you ever, you know, experience a cleaner shrimp, uh, like we had at the aquarium for a little bit, they would actually uh, kind of clean your hand, picking off dead skin, parasites. And so they're experiencing uh, a positive benefit by getting food. 
And then the animals that get cleaned, it's kind of similar to the mola mola where the birds are removing parasites uh, that are on the mola mola. The cleaner shrimps removing parasites and other things uh, off of the uh, the fish. And the fish, they actually come to cleaning stations I've heard on Chica. Like mm -hmm. they'll, they'll kind of come to the shrimp because they're aware of that relationship. And it's really cool because um, from what I've seen in videos, the cleaner shrimp will actually just kind of stand up and wave their legs around being like, hey, over here, I'm here to clean you. Come here if you wanna get a little spa treatment. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really cool. Nice little ocean manicure. And we actually, uh, we actually have a video here to show of uh, what the cleaner shrimp do in action. So let's see if we can get this guy going. So it's yep. really cool because we have these cleaner shrimp at the aquarium. You might've seen it if you've come in the past few months, um, uh, but it's really awesome because you can actually see, this is one of our coworkers hands in the uh, cleaner shrimp tank and you see how they're hopping on, just trying to get on her and actually eat off some of that dead skin. So in the ocean, they're not actually eating dead skin, um, but here we, our water is pretty clear, clean, doesn't have any parasites in it. So uh, this is, this is kind of where they get those little extra bits of food. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's really cool watching them them do their thing. And I've also one time I I was in a I was in Sweden and I went to a, an aquarium there and they had a a similar experience. They had this tank full of these little fish, and you might have most people are more familiar from spa treatments with the fish where you dip like your feet or your hands in, and then these little fish are eating all the things off of. Uh, your feet and it was just like a similar similar example like this those fish that also clean things uh they're getting food uh and nutrients off of your hands and you're and like uh those fish do the same thing to you know other animals in their environments so this is kind of something you can find in uh, a number of species actually so it's really cool it's just like also like i mentioned rhinos how sometimes they have birds on them they're they're picking off those uh like flies and things that live around them so it's just super cool seeing how many different types of animals all over the place can really do this type of symbiosis. Now, I know we got another one coming up, and this one is one of my absolute favorite types of symbiosis we just learned about on Chica. Take it away. I love these guys so much. They're first, they're stinking cute. Look mm -hmm. at that little hermit crab. Um, what's really cool? So, this is another mutualistic um, uh, relationship that we actually have in the same exhibit that those cleaner shrimp are in. These ones right here are staghorn hermit crabs. And these guys are warm water species. And what's really cool is that is actually live coral on the back of that hermit crab. And just to give you an idea of size, like they are tiny, like I'd say like maybe this big total. Yeah, yeah this photo is zoomed in very, very it's, 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 you would totally miss them if, if you didn't point them out or someone, you can see them, they're very tiny. Yeah, so what happens is that um, they're called staghorn hermit crabs because it's a little hermit crab that the coral will land on its shell and will kind of grow super big and erode the hermit crab shell away, essentially becoming its shell. So it creates, like it, it's basically a hermit crab that has live coral growing on its back. Live coral is its back essentially. And so it's a really good relationship because the coral um, gets to, it actually protects the hermit crab and creates like this great environment for the hermit crab. And by the hermit crab moving around, it provides the coral with more sun, more um, nutrients, things like that. So it's kind of a dynamic environment for both of them. And it's yeah. really cool. I've heard, um, I was doing some reading on these guys and it turns out that after the, uh, the coral polyp, lands on and dissolves the crab shell and and grows on it the crab uses its shells to kind of clean away more space for it to actually live inside of the shell and when we had these at the uh the aquarium a few weeks ago i actually would see sometimes them uh go inside the uh little uh piece of coral so they kind of carve their way out and make like a new home inside the coral rather than having a shell yeah it's really cool and what's really crazy is that these hermit crabs are so small but those shells can get really big and super unwieldy and they're able to survive with it because they've lived with it their whole life. So they can kind of, they figured out kind of how to make it work, which is yeah. Cool. I read that these, uh, like you mentioned, they, they, they can still live with it and carry it for a long time, even though it gets, gets big. And I, I read that these staghorn hermit crabs can carry 
uh, up to 30 times their own weight on their own back. So as the coral grows and they're living their lives, it doesn't, doesn't bother because like hermit crabs, these guys are adapted over a long time. Like, like we've mentioned, these symbiotic relationships aren't anything new. They haven't just started. So this has been going on for a long time. So, you know, you would think maybe, oh, having a bunch of coral on a hermit crab's back would mean it couldn't go anywhere. But I mean, quite the opposite. I think the reason why this symbiotic relationship was able to really form was because of the abilities and the adaptations of not only the coral to move freely and disperse and land on the hermit crab, but the hermit crab's ability to carry that much weight. So I think it's really cool how their adaptations are kind of working hand in hand to make this work. Definitely. And so we've talked about all these really cool types of symbiosis. Um, and now there's kind of been a dependence, like these animals have evolved a little bit of a dependence on each other, right? Just with how, how, much, how useful their relationship is. I think a really important question to, uh, a really important question to ask is what happens when the two individuals get separated? Oh yeah, because it seems they they rely on each other a lot, especially like that that hermit crab and that coral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's definitely a really good question um, to think about because when symbionts get separated, especially ones that are mutualistic and have created such a dependence, it's really it's not very good. So an example that comes to mind is actually coral bleaching. So I think everyone has seen pictures of coral, like beautiful tropical corals. Coral is actually an animal and inside of it are tiny little algae in its tissues called zooxanthellae. Yes, I, I, like to, oh, so I like to think of uh, coral just as a quick visual. It's like an apartment building. Think of it as like a big an apartment complex for all these little organisms living in it. Yep, exactly. So. The coral is the house and the algae, the zooxanthellae, are all the little tenants inside the apartment building. So all the tenants, the algae are doing photosynthesis and they provide the coral animal with oxygen. So it creates, it, it helps the coral survive and the coral polyps create a little house for the algae and provide them with carbon dioxide for them to turn back into oxygen. And why this is really important is because coral reefs can actually live in areas that don't have a lot of nutrients just in the water. And that's why it's so important. So this relationship is super important because it just helps create these nutrients in areas that don't normally have nutrients. Mm -hmm. And the reason that these symbionts can get s separated is because when corals are stressed with high water temperatures or ocean acidification, they can expel those algae and the corals aren't able to survive. Like they get, they just get stressed and it just happens. Uh -oh. And that's what coral bleaching is. So that's when they've expelled all of this colorful algae that makes them so beautiful and it leaves them kind of like a white looking skeleton. Mm -hmm. And coral reefs can definitely bounce back from that. But after prolonged periods of bleaching, it's really hard, if not impossible, to bring the coral back to life. So they can survive for short amounts of time in higher water temperatures, but as water temperature continues to increase, it actually, it ruins that relationship that they have with the algae because they just can't survive. Yeah. That's why it's really important to reduce our carbon footprint and our impacts on the planet because yeah. it causes things like this. I, I agree, definitely, Anshika. Very important to like know these things as to you know know why it's mindful that we look after them and protect them as much as we can. And so, as we're talking about how symbionts get separated, we're talking about a mutualistic one here with the corals and stuff. But what about the opposite end of the spectrum? Like, what about something with parasitism? Um, what would happen when uh, a more negative relationship is broken up with like that? Yeah. So kind of the thing that I would think would happen in that situation is just that the parasite wouldn't be able to survive. The host would be fine because they, they were fine before the parasite. They'll be fine after the parasite. But the parasite itself, its main goal is to find another host. So if, the, if it gets separated, they won't, they won't be able to feed. They won't be able to survive unless they find another host. So it yeah. really kind of, that's their main goal is whenever they get separated is all right, on to the next one. Let's go. Yeah. So it looks like, it looks like in no matter what the type of symbiosis, someone, the person who is benefiting, you know, they're going to be negatively affected. Whereas even though some animals uh, in like a negative or commensalism one might not notice it, there's always going to be someone negatively affected when symbionts get separated. So definitely, definitely is important to know, um, you know, how 
how these different types of interactions are happening and where. Yeah. And along that same note, just talking about, we kind of wanted to go back to that original question we had about why symbiosis is important. Now that we've kind of discussed it a little bit, um, feel free if you have any ideas, feel free to drop them in the chat as well. But Alan, so why is symbiosis so important? Yeah, so coming from a, uh, you know, a scientist perspective, symbiosis is, is really important for a few reasons. Um, it can lead to new uh, animal niches and adaptations. It can allow animals to survive in areas they, they normally wouldn't be able to, and especially, you know, evolve, like evolve together. Um, when it comes to symbiosis, one of the main fascinations between um, symbiosis and scientists is there's this one really uh, widely accepted theory called symbiogenesis. And it's actually one of the, the theories that kind of explains the key origins to complex life on Earth. And so basically, um, if you look at like a cell and all its different parts inside of the cell, like let's say the ribosome, the nucleus, all these things that provide different functions for uh, the cell to able to work, which then makes up, you know, us living organisms. We're all, we have cells that make up our bodies. Uh, scientists hypothesize that actually those celled organisms came from symbiosis between those little things. So things like ribosomes, nuclei, mitochondria, they're known as microbes. These are microorganisms. And so a long, long time ago, as these microbes might have uh, come together and they started forming these bigger cells, which came to grow into complex life. So that's one really important way scientists look and study one of like the, a really big symbiotic uh, relationship. And they also, scientists also study symbiosis. It's really important because it helps them learn about the environment. Um, when you're studying and you're looking at a, a different environment uh, all over the place, you want to look at what animals are living inside there, um, how they're interacting. And that's really important because when you're learning how to take care and protect these areas, you know, knowing how they all interact together is very, very crucial to know. And it's one of the, the, the great tips that can help us, you know, preserve and save these uh, species. Uh, Anshika, do you have like any other kind of uh, suggestions on why symbiosis is so important? Yeah, definitely. So I think it's really cool just how amazing symbiosis is and it creates like you were saying, it creates new niches and it allows animals to live in places where they normally wouldn't be able to. So animals that live super deep in the ocean, like two worms, they have, they do symbiosis because they don't get sunlight. Um, so they have their own ways of creating energy. And it's really cool thinking about all of these animals that have evolved to live in areas that you really wouldn't expect animals to live in. And it's honestly really awesome just because it creates so many more places for animals to survive and it creates, scientists can learn from it too. And it's definitely just really awesome. It's just, uh, it's honestly just so bizarre thinking that these, these different creatures have evolved to work together through no like physical communication. They're not like, all right, we're gonna work together. It's very like, it just one individual did it and they're like, ah, yes, that works. So yeah, they evolved just, to keep doing it, which is super cool. Yeah, it just like naturally, naturally came together. And honestly, like, I think that's cool that we're, you know, we're not just relating symbiosis in this talk to just, you know, oh, like the clownfish just helps the enemy. Like we're trying to take it as far back and as big as possible because just like the whole concept of animals working together in symbiosis, it, it kind of broadens your mind uh, when you look at just like an, ex like, like an environment in particular, because now um, knowing more how symbiosis happens all over the place, whether it's a mutualistic one or it's predation, something that happens as commonly as prey affecting predators, uh, you really see that symbiosis is everywhere. It's not this little, just rare thing that you occasionally saw in a few animals. It's, it's happening everywhere and it's happening all the time. And what's really awesome is kind of thinking about how, how we as humans can kind of learn from symbiosis and, all work together. Like humans have to work together and teamwork is such an important part of being a human and just being being a good person. And it's super awesome that like we can learn so much from these animals and like we can use teamwork to do things that we also normally can't. So symbiosis is not just in non-human animals, we do symbiosis too. 
It's yeah, just definitely. It's sort of call that. Yeah, teamwork makes a dream work, just like we said earlier. And I think it's it's cool when you can look at uh, you know, you can look at symbiosis and look at it as, as waves animals solve problems. They they come together and they they come together for like a a common cause. And so, you know, just symbiosis, we just we love it because when you get down to it, it's it's cliche, but teamwork really does make the dream work. And so uh, like this, this live stream on Cheek and I, we're symbiosising together. We got Caitlin on the other end. Mutualistic relationships here. Yeah, we're all working together to get the job done. And I think that's awesome that we can look at symbiosis and, and learn that kind of lesson from our natural animal friends. And like always, we're always learning from these guys and they, they continue, continue to fascinate me every day. Yes, I agree. All yeah. right. I think that is the end of our time. Um, but feel free, if you guys have any questions, you can pop them in. Thanks so much for joining us today to learn about one of our favorite topics. Yeah. Thanks again, guys. Uh, and yeah, have a good rest of your day. Happy Bye. holidays.